Check it. We are back with another episode. Uh, thank you for tuning in, as always. Another week. And um, for those of you watching on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe, like, and hit that bell notification just so that you can be informed whenever there's a new episode, a new video that drops. All right? And thank you for that support. It doesn't cost you anything, but it greatly appreciated over here, and it helps grow this channel. If you're listening to this episode on Podbean, I love you, and I continue, you know, your continued support, continue to do that for me. Uh, make sure you share the episode, uh, leave your comments. I love it when I see those comments, and I'll get back to you with that and keep the conversation going. Now, with the preliminaries out of the way, welcome back to another week. And, um, you know... This one is is one that really means something to me. It's something that I pride myself in on a regular basis, whether in my personal life or at work or just, you know, socializing with folks um, outside of both of those uh, spaces. And there's something special that happens when you care about others in all areas of your life. I think that's important. And that's what this episode is going to be about for me is that as human beings, I think we are complex species. But the problem is we tend to, you know, go out of our way to simplify our interactions with others. And I'm, I'm curious as to why we do that. I've always been curious about this question. Right? Why do we go out of our way to simplify, you know, things or our interactions with other people? Because there's nothing simple about us in so many ways. We're complex, right? With the nuances of emotions and and the way we, you know, process information, our our responses, reactions, and all those things kind of play a role in it. So it's always been fascinating for me how we, we. get to that space where we're trying to simplify and oversimplify um, our engagement with other people, right? Um, I found that there are key identifiers that need to be recognized, right? And in this episode, I really want to spend some time on, you know, educators, facilitators, teachers, um, leaders, and anybody who's in that space, right? And I think those individuals or professional uh, professors or professionals, I should say, right, um, need to be able to recognize these identifiers. And that's what this episode is really about. Um, when, when people matter, what does that look like? And how can that in- impact or change the way we do things in our society, Right? So let me jump right into it. As a professional, right, in any of those fields that I mentioned, as a professional, the material you deliver is important, right? It is one of the, you know, critical requirements, okay, to have material that is relevant. But there's other components to it that makes it very essential. The preparation, that you put into delivering that material. So if you know the material, if you know the content, it's one thing. But you have no idea who your audience is going to be on any particular day or moment. So how do you prepare for that uncertainty? Right? And that's the point. You must be prepared, regardless of how many times you've delivered that content. Right? And the question some of you might have is, how do I prepare if I don't know my audience? Well, you have to prepare in a way that you you are rounded and complete enough that you can, you know, um, be in audible mode, right? You can kind of scramble and make the adjustments on the on the fly 
knowing the different ways that you can deliver this material is important. And that's a part of the preparation, right? The way you deliver the material is going to have an impact. Your style and your approach are just as important, right? A part of your responsibility is to ensure that you are engaging your learners and participants. So if you prepare in a linear fashion, you're, you're restricting your, your, your material and also your skill sets. You're limiting yourself. Plus, on top of that, you're making it about you and not your audience. Pardon me for that. Right? And not your audience. There needs to be a plan in place. And what is your plan? When you're preparing to deliver old material or a new material to different, you know, sets of learners. Because Monday, you might have a different audience and they might be younger. Tuesday, you're delivering the same content, but it might be, you know, young adults. And then Wednesday, you're delivering the same material, but it's now seniors or professionals. It's got to be able to, you know, you have to be able to modify it and alter it on the fly to meet the needs of your audience, right? So what is your plan? And I think that's, that's what this is about, right? And although the presenter, right, prepares with his or her uh, learners in mind, sometimes the presenter's ego gets in their way, right? And what I mean by that is it gets in the way in the sense that you're not even open to hearing feedback from your learners, um, concerns that they might have, things that work well, and how you can improve on this, right? Some people do presentations and they never have a, a survey or a pre-survey that allows them to learn more about their participants, maybe discover something new about their learning styles or disabilities, um, that they might have some challenges or some things that really work well for them. And knowing that information makes your job that much easier and it makes you do a much better job. It makes you deliver the material in a way that is extremely relatable to that, that audience. And that's a part of their prep. What are you doing before that day you have to deliver the material? And that's what it's about. Right. So don't allow your ego to get in the way. It's also important to develop, develop the skill, you know, that allows you to identify when your ego is getting in the way. You have to be able to catch yourself. Are you at some points um, feeling like you're becoming more defensive when someone challenges your ideas? Right. Or your perspective. Are you rattled? Are you shaken where it kind of throws you off course or your thought process? And that you're unable to kind of regroup and continue because you didn't anticipate anybody ever speaking back to you in, in this presentation. That might be something for you to consider. And that's you being able to check when your ego is about to get in the way. Because once that, 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 that moment happens, guess what? There's a blockage. There's a disconnect momentarily, but it's a huge impact because it shows whether you are as good as you you know, presented yourself to be in that moment to your audience. And that's where they get to see right through you. And they get to understand who you are. But when that moment happens and you embrace it and you say, you know what? I did not know that. Wow. Tell me a little bit more. Now I turn it over to that learner. I allow them to guide me. And in that moment, I become the student. I become the learner, right? And because I become the learner, guess what? They become the facilitator, the educator, the teacher, right? The leader. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty in it. I've allowed myself to grow in that space, but I've also allowed them to expand as well in their knowledge, right? So now I'm out of my comfort zone and so are they. And here we go, right? It's not combative, working together and everyone else listening in that room benefits everyone benefits so don't trip <laughs> allow your learners to share their experiences their knowledge and all of that because it allow you to get more information and how to make your programming better and guess what a lot of that information that you might get from them you can infuse into that presentation 
just to make it much more richer for the next group that you present, right? Your material should be evolving as your audience is and as you are. So keep that in mind, right? A few things um, um, to also keep in mind to check the ego, right? And, and kind of manage that ego. Um, and it, it often happens where you fail to recognize your learners, you know, uh, expressions, facial expressions, body language, and reactions to your approach or your style of teaching or, or delivery, right? If you are paying attention to all those things, then and and actually reacting to those things, it'll make you become a better presenter, right? Yes, it's difficult at times to shift your focus from making sure you deliver the material. Um, to how the audience is responding to the material and your delivery style. I get that. It's not easy, but that comes with experience. And that's what this whole thing is about, right? How do we become better presenters, okay? But when the presenter believes that they are perfect, they are great, and they are excellent, when that presenter believes that, you know, if the learner doesn't understand something, it is the learner's fault, Right. And it's at these junctions uh, when things begin to fall apart for both the learner and that leader or that facilitator or teacher. OK, that's the ego taking over there. Right. There's nothing wrong with me. I've been teaching this thing for 10 years or five years or a whole year. And the material is great. I don't need to tweak it. Everybody else before you got it. I don't understand why you're having a problem with it. Right. And they don't take any, you know, responsibility for the fact that maybe their style is off. Maybe their energy is off that day. Maybe the material is not working for this particular group. Right. So recognize that these are cues. Right. These are hints that your learners are actually giving you. So allow yourself to kind of, you know, absorb some of that and make it better and take note of that and say, hey, I wonder What's going on? Why do you look like that? Why Why do you have that expression on your face? Something's off. Something's not connecting, right? That's how I would take that approach. I'm always looking at my audience to make sure they understand. And if I catch something, an expression that's a little off, then I'm going to stop and actually inquire about that expression. Did I lose you somewhere, right? Um, does it make sense to you? Not yet. Where's the disconnect? Help me understand so I can help you better. OK, and then allow them to explain. I'm going to listen to their complete thought. Once I get that information, I can say, OK, you know what? Let me try it this way. And I give a completely different um, um, analogy or example and hopes that works. Sometimes I have to do three examples. Right. And and it's unfortunate, but there are those in the group that already got it from the first example I gave. But some people need three and four examples for it to hit home. And so what I normally do is I go back and forth with those who already got it. I go back to them. I say, listen, I appreciate that you guys got it right away. Thank you for your patience and understanding. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Right. We are a, a platoon, a unit here and no person is to be left behind. And that's my motto. I don't want to leave anybody behind. So bear with me as I get them on board. And, and there's no judgment here. Right. And once we're all on the same page, guess what? We keep going. We keep going. And that's what it is, right? So um, this is really to that presenter who suffers from this complex, right? I need you to remember this. It's not all about you. It's not about you. So don't make it about you, okay? Remove yourself from that, okay? You know, um, and as a presenter or facilitator, a coach, a teacher, or an educator, you are as much a learner as those you are sharing information or directing. Right? You are also here to learn. You are not perfect. You're far from that. Right? You've just been uh, fortunate enough that you've had a whole lot more of knowledge and information bestowed upon you. And so you have that privilege of sharing that does not make you perfect. You just have a little bit more information than the other person in a particular area. 
right? But you have to recognize in yourself that those that you're sharing your knowledge with also have a particular set of information and, and knowledge that are, you know, specific to them and their experiences that you have not experienced. And so you have to be open to get some of that information in your system, right? Um, but I want you to ask yourself this. I really want you to ask yourself this. Am I open and willing to learn from those that I'm presenting to? This goes to anybody. If you're a coach, are you willing and open to listening to your players and actually taking their feedback? And it's one thing to listen to somebody, right? Especially if the information is good. It's one thing to just listen and that's it. But it's another thing to listen and adopt and apply. That's power. That's influence, right? That's what you want. To be able to take something and you can get anything. You can get jewels from, you know, someone who's four, someone who's seven, someone who's 20, someone who's 17, you know, someone who's 80. Like it's it's a range of people that you can get, you know, wealth of knowledge from. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, right? Then the other part is, do I believe they can teach me something new, right? Or if they can teach me anything at all? And the answer should be yes, I should believe that. Because that allows me to be open, right? And the minute I feel open, guess what? Opportunity starts to flow. And then finally, I want you to ask yourself this. Do I value their opinions, those that I'm presenting to, right? Do their thoughts matter to me? And, and how do they matter to me? And why do they matter to me? Because those things are also just as important. You have to consider all these things. This is what's going to make you a better presenter. These questions that you have to ask yourself is going to put you over to the next level. All right? Because you have to be open. It's important to be open. Okay? Now, one of the biggest challenges I, I, I've encountered myself as well as of witnessing other facilitators or presenters is... What will I do if something doesn't, you know, someone doesn't understand me or the material and, and how I'm delivering it? What do I do in that situation? Right? Because a lot of us who do a lot of this type of work have been in that situation where you're delivering something, but there is a huge disconnect. There's no interest. The body language of your audience is, is non-existent. They're disconnected from you. They're not engaged, but you're just pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing this thing down their throat and you're saying, oh, this is great stuff and, you know, you guys need this stuff. But what happens when you hit that wall and you realize a large percentage of the people in that room are not interested in what you're saying and how you're delivering it, you're not reaching them, right? Now, a part of that solution is understanding who you are presenting to. So if you didn't do any research to find out who your audience members were and what they were interested in, right, that's going to have an impact. You're most likely going to hit that wall more often than you would like. So you have to find out who's your audience, right? You need to have a sense of how they learn and then incorporate their learning styles into your presentation style. You make it about them and their experience. It's not about you and just your experience and how you deliver it and how great you think you are. That means nothing. The person receiving the information is the one that benefits the most. It's the one that you need to be catering to the most, right? If you're looking at sales for the, as an example, right? Sales is a great example um, where they say the customer is always right. Well, the right customer is always right, right? And sometimes... The wrong customer is also right. You know what I mean? So we need to keep those things in mind. And the reason why I spoke about all this stuff is because I wanted to focus on the learning theory um, pedagogy. Right? The word means the method and practice of teaching children. Right? Now... I'll also have a separate episode on andragogy, which is um, the method and practice of teaching um, adult learners. 
Okay, so there's two different ways to go about it. I kind of alluded to the adults um, portion in this presentation itself, but I'm, I'm focusing on pedagogy and, and how um, it's been used over decades and centuries. Okay, so studies related to pedagogy and its impact over decades literally is declining, right? It's on a down down slope, right? There are various reasons for this decline, and the obvious one is the workload of teachers and educators and how um, they understand or interpret pedagogy theory and the practical approach. So a lot of our young teachers, and even some of the older ones, right? You go through teacher's college, and they teach you how to deliver material. Um, you get a chance to do it in a practical field and so forth, right? But I don't know if that that method um, and that theory is still relevant in 2022, right? Because I've asked the question, like, how how is this theory being applied in our current state, in our education system? And, and is it relevant still today? Because I understand why it was beneficial during the industrial era, right? But we're no longer in that era, okay? So each person must determine this for themselves and how they apply it to their spaces and the learners' learning styles that they are faced with, okay? So a bit of a um, backstory for you with uh, pedagogy and how it works, Okay? It addresses several attributes in the past and continues to address them today. That's a fact. It also addresses behaviorism, critical thinking, and self-expression, right? So these are just a few that I want to kind of spend some time on on this episode because I think they are important and they're also easy to digest. It's also easy for us to comprehend and move forward and see how we can apply it, Okay. So if you look at behaviorism, it's based on the traditional concept of the teacher being the one in control of the learning space, right? They're at the front of the classroom. They're telling you what it is that you need to know. This is how you do it. Follow me. And this is how we do it. You step out of that box. It's a problem. No, that's not how I'm teaching it. I need you to do it the way I'm teaching it, right? Um, the other thing with um, pedagogy and, and behaviorism is that it claims that Repetition is the best way to learn. There's definitely some truth to that, right? All we have to do is observe some of the most successful athletes, entertainers, and business moguls. A high percentage of these um, of their actions are repeti repetitive and consistent, right? If you speak to anybody who's you know made it to the top of whatever industry, repetition. They didn't give up. They believed in themselves, and it was uh, a continuous repetition of habits and they just stuck to it right and that's where they got to that point okay behaviorism um, also informs us that giving praise encourages behaviors which is true right it also guides learners towards a particular condition and a set of understandings we call that today programming think about it think about it Right. If you look at civil rights, you look at the feminist uh, feminist uh, movement, you look at all these different movements. Right. An entity had to remind us and repeat the messaging, repeat the messaging until we bought into it. That's called programming. OK, so behaviorism is essential to how people have learned over the years and continue to learn today. So, yes, it's important um, the fact still remains that we all have a form of programming, right? Whether we like it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, it's there in every single one of us. And this is something that we need to come to terms with. Okay. This attribute also contributes, um, to the structure, right? Uh, it provides structure to learners overall, um, experience. Okay. It gives them an understanding that a, 
um, to be, it's going to give us whatever information in between. It gives us uh, an understanding that if you're doing your division, right, you can do it in a particular order, right? Uh, if you're writing sentences, right, you need to understand where you're placing your commas and your your periods and your punctuations and uh, when do you take a pause when you're reading a long sentence and when do you continue to go and, and all these things. This is all structure, right? We need to have that, okay? Um, unfortunately, this method fails to consider a few things, right? It also doesn't encourage independent thinking or logic because nowhere in this process have we stop for a moment and said, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. I haven't heard a student say that to a teacher when I was in school, right? I haven't heard that. Um, the only time I had the courage to actually challenge uh, a professor was when I was in a college at OCAD, right? And so, you know, this was art history. It, it just wasn't logical to me. And, and the debate that we were having, I just told the teacher it didn't make any sense and that I disagreed with her uh, perspective on it. And I can't adopt it. She didn't like that too too well. She didn't take it too well either. And so, therefore, we had some conflict there, right? Which, you know, allowed me to just say, you know what? Forget this. I don't need this course. And I dropped the course. And, you know, when I take another course that was more suited to my interests and a teacher that was, you know, more understanding to, to people with different ideas, right? More open to new ideas and, and people that would challenge the norms. So this is what I'm talking about. There's no independent thinking allowed with this structure when it comes to behavioralism, right? And, and pedagogy. So the other part is <clears throat> critical thinking and self-expression, right? Um, these are two areas that are underdeveloped when a government or a teacher is given complete autonomy over the learning environment, right? The experience and the learning process. So if a teacher has sole control, right, or a government body, a government body, then you are suppressing that individual or independent thinking because there's a system. And that system says we need everyone to follow this protocol, this procedure, this process, and that's a part of the challenge, right? This method um, and approach of teaching also or delivering information to young learners isn't tailored to the needs of those learners. So no one ever stopped to ask, what do you need in order to become the best student? What do you need um, to be the best at what it is that you're interested in? What are your interests? Nobody's asked that question. We walked into the classroom, you chose a desk, you sat down, and the information was thrown at you. Chapters were given to you, and they said, read it, do the homework, show up, and memorize as much as you can, because you're going to be tested on how much of this you remember. And throughout this entire process, four or five years in high school and even college, none of the information was of interest to me, right? Then you, you get labeled. And when you get labeled, you get placed into a particular group, right? Or a particular stream, right, of academics and so forth. So this is what we're doing. None of this has to do with the ind individual or their needs, okay? And what this means huh, is professionals are teaching from an equality lens or perspective and not necessarily an equitable one, right? Because the needs of the learners are never considered. But the ultimate goal is the school needs to have a high passing rate, higher grades and whatnot. And the material doesn't change year after year, right? Generation after generation, a few tweaks here and there, but the material is still the same. Sounds pretty concerning, and it should. It should. This should really push you to start thinking and looking at our system a little differently with a critical eye, obviously, right? Um, and that's what I'm trying to evoke here is to get you to start thinking differently. Think outside the box. Don't accept just the norm, okay? And I'm going to talk more about that in uh, another episode where I'm focusing on critical thinking, okay? But um, on this topic here, though, 
teachers are often literally in the position of assessing and observing behaviors, right? Not necessarily what's happening in the minds of the learners because they don't, they don't have a clue, right? How the material and the style of delivery is impacting the learner's development. No one's considering that. The way in which the learner processes that information and how they retain right, their new knowledge, no one considers that because it doesn't matter. It does not matter. Not in this system anyway, right? So these are the things that I, I want you to really consider. Um, take a closer look at how your child, if you're a parent, is learning and how they're being assessed by their teachers when you get those report cards, right? So think about how you were taught up until your senior year in high school and how you learned and which content did you retain, right? Um, from during those years, because those are supposed to be our formidable year, formidable years, right? So, what do you remember from high school, right? And that's a big question. What do you remember that's still relevant to you today? And you have to look at the entire picture of all those years. Okay, what did you get over all those four or five years if you had OAC? Okay, and what portion? of that information during those four or five years do you use in your adult life today? First of all, what do you remember? Because remember, it was all about memorizing. So what do you remember? If you don't remember much, that means none of it was really relevant to you and, you know, it didn't, it didn't apply to you. So were they beneficial or were they not? And those are questions we have to ask ourselves as, as parents. Okay, what is important? Because if you yourself went through this system and you don't see the benefit as an adult now, why give your child such a hard time when they also display the same disinterest that you had when you were a student? But no, the hypocritical uh, mind state is that we want to tell our children, no, education is important and it's good for you. It's going to give you a better job. We heard that too, but most of us didn't get the better job. We didn't. Most of us didn't even get in the field that we wanted. Most of us settled for whatever job was available and willing to pay us. So let's be honest with the conversations that we're having now, right? And that's what this is about. I'm trying to challenge some of these systems and some of these norms, okay? Now, I can also say with great confidence that none of your teachers... Right. When you were in school, had a clue what went on in your mind, how the material, you know, contributed to your development as an individual or how you process information in all the books you were forced to read and how much of all that you kept and still use as an adult today. And that's the reality of it. Most of it does not apply to us today. Now. I want to spend a little bit of time on. Some of the con, right? I'm going to play on words a little bit here. Concerns with the, the pedagogy um, theory uh, and, and its practice, right? So it merely exists in order for us to compare our ways of teaching, right? But educate and reevaluate the way we teach and deliver information. That's what it's for. In a nutshell, that's the sole purpose of it, right? Uh, it's an opportunity for us to assess different ways we can do things or areas that need improving. That's essentially what it is. Our current education system merely right, fills learners' minds with information. However, if we provide learners with the skills that they need, they can identify their areas of interest much sooner, which in turn will expedite the development of a passion for a field, a career, or even an industry. Right. But that's what we need to do. Right. Give them the skills that they need. Having a society compiled with a large percentage of free and critical thinkers could be, you know, a great thing. But we need balance. And if it could be a great thing, it could also be a detrimental um, situation to the society. Right. It, it's one of those things you can't win. You can't have one you know, half of it dominating over another. You need balance, 
Okay. So I'm not saying to get rid of it. It still has its use. It has its purpose, but it just needs to be balanced with something else. What is that something else? We'll talk about in another episode. Okay. Now, if a glass, right, think about a, a, a glass cup. I mean, give me one second here. I'm just taking a sip of this water. Right? So think about that. If this mug that I just took a sip from, right, or a glass, <clears throat> whatever it is that you drink from, if it had arms and legs, it would be able to fill itself. And all we would have to do is request what we want placed into that that cup or that glass or that mug, right? So I could I could tell my mug, hey, listen, uh, get me some orange juice. Then it's going to walk because it has legs. Pick up the jar of, of juice and pour it in itself, right? Put it back and then walk over and I take a sip. <laughs> right? So think about that. It's not about learning things. Instead, the way in which we learn things. This approach puts the learner first, not the teacher or the material. So basically what I'm saying is teach our kids how to fish. Teach our kids why it's important to know how to fish. Right? Teach our kids the benefits of fishing. As far as how it does, what it does to our body, our minds, right? Our, 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 and all the experiences that we get from the act of fishing. But if you just put someone in a room and play a video or you show them a whole bunch of text and you say memorize it without any context as to why they need to do this, why are they doing this, what's the benefit, why is it even significant for me to even be in this room, then you just wasted everyone's time and ability and energy. And this is what our current education system is doing is wasting everyone's time, efforts, and energy. We have a whole lot of skills that are going by the wayside because we rely on somebody else to do something for us. Right? Someone else has the arms and the legs, and they create these mugs, and all we're doing is drinking we have no idea how to develop the arms. We have no idea how to get the legs. We have no idea how the mug came to be or the glass. We just know that we want the juice inside and it came to us without ever thinking about what went through that process. There's no understanding. And when there's no understanding, there's a huge disconnect. And when there's a huge disconnect, that's what we call today sheep. Okay? So, again, it's not about learning things. Instead, the way in which we learn things. The approach puts the learner first, and not the teacher or the material. Educators or teachers are best described as referees in a sporting match. They are simply there to guide, ensure safety, and provide support or assistance when needed. They should not have the presence of an authoritarian or a boss right they should not be the center of attention or focus during the learning process and they are the resource and should be used based on the needs of those accessing them not the latter okay so i want to wrap this all up for you and say that Pedagogy may not be the ideal teaching theory or method for today. However, it allows for the introduction of new theories because of its limitations. Allow yourself, if you are an educator, a teacher, a facilitator, a leader, allow yourself to explore new theories and ideas about how you deliver your next lesson, workshop, or content. Allow yourself to put your learner's needs first, Consider their learning styles, abilities, and disabilities that may or may not hinder their experience. Allow yourself to learn from them. One style or one approach cannot and will not fit all your learners. Ensure 
that you consider how your learners consume information and how they process, interpret information. Don't make it about you. It's not about how comfortable you need to be, but how uncomfortable are you willing to become. The teaching and the learning process is like a team sport. It's a process of sharing, trusting, believing, and taking the lead at times and other times being able to follow. So thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe and hit that bell to catch the latest videos. Like and share the content. Be sure to follow the show on Podbean or your preferred streaming platform. And to all my listeners, like always, until next next episode, love, peace, and nappiness.